galvanized campus in San Francisco. It's the Cube, covering Apache Sparkmaker community event, brought to you by IBM. Now, here are your hosts, John Walls and George Gilbert. And welcome back to San Francisco on theCUBE. We're continuing our coverage here of Apache Sparkmaker Communities event. It's uh, to all day today and then to tonight. General session is tonight here in Galvanize, which is uh, downtown. It's just about a mile from the Hilton, which is where the Spark Summit is going on Tuesday and Wednesday. We'll be over there for coverage as well on those days. I'm with George Gilbert, I'm John Walls, and we're joined by J.J. Allaire, who is the founder and the CEO of uh, our studio and JJ, thanks for being with us. Absolutely, we appreciate your time. making to be your here. Cube debut. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, so tell us a little bit about our studio, if you will, then just to, to set the stage and inform yeah. some folks at home yeah. who might not be familiar with. Sure, the our, our studio is a company that builds uh, tools around the R statistical computing environment, and R is actually uh, I call it a statistical computing environment. It's also a programming language. It was actually invented 40 years ago at AT&T Bell Labs. At that time it was called S. Uh, and it's, it's amazingly kind of continued to grow in relevance. You know, it's a 40 year old programming language that's sort of just hitting its stride. It's, uh, it's really a remarkable story. Um, it was built at the time as a way to, pr at the time all the data analysis was done in Fortran. And uh, there was all these you know, decades old, high performance, robust statistical routines, but statisticians and analysts weren't able to really use them productively because they were all Fortran. So S was created to create an interactive interface for all of this great computational power. Uh, and that sort of grew up into R. And, uh, and now my company, our studio, builds a, a lot of tools around around R. So now you, you've got this this 40-year-old language yeah. uh, marrying up with this five-year-old yeah. uh, <laughs> computing framework in yeah. Spark. What is that relationship all about? Yeah. How did that come uh, about? It, well, really what it is is that um, Spark has this incredible, uh, incredibly rich environment for doing distributed computing, having distributed data sets, distributed machine learning. It's really powerful. Um, it's it actually allows you to work interactively. It's high performance enough that you can work interactively. So the interesting marriage here is that R was built from day one to be an interactive data analysis environment. It's a programming language that was built to be this sort of, ha to, to support a conversation between the analyst and the data. Mm -hmm. And so as, as a result, it's very productive, very easy to use, um, has a lot of really great data visualization libraries. And I think what, uh, what people are really interested in is they want to take that user experience that there are you know, millions now of people using R mm -hmm. and allow them to take that user experience and use it within a Spark environment. Uh, and that's really, really, really powerful combination. So was it waiting then you think for a, a, a framework like Spark? to come along because yeah. now all of a sudden this is the, the great value. I mean, you've, yeah. hit, you've hit the grand yeah. slam basically. In a way, I mean, R has always, as I said at the beginning, it was about interfacing to Fortran code. And there was this tr treasure trove of Fortran code that nobody could get to. And over the years, I mean, it's interfaced, you know, more so today it interfaces with a lot of native code, but also it interfaces with distributed computing frameworks like H2O. Um, so it, it, it R, I, I, it's, it's the creator of R, John Chambers just gave a talk uh, last year a couple years ago at USAR where he said R is an interface language. And he really emphasized that whatever it is that's out there that's interesting, we, we want to be able to create a really nice interface for. So I mean, R hasn't been waiting. I mean, I think it's been interfacing with things that are interesting. I think there's a great opportunity to, to provide a great interface to Spark uh, for, for people who use R. Uh, and, and so I, I think there's a, it's a great opportunity. So, it, it so, so tell us this. Um there's a bit of religion in the choice of any language. Yep, yep, yep. What are the, you know, not, so this event is Spark focused, yes, which means yes. we're talking about Java, Scala, yep, that's right, Python, yeah. and R. Yep, yep. Who are the, the Yeah, tribes? that's a great question. The, I would say in, in general, the, the, the R was created by statisticians for statisticians. So statisticians tend to really readily understand R. It makes a huge amount of sense to them. Um, software engineers tend to look at R and they're confused by what they see and it doesn't work the way that other languages uh, work that they expect. So I would say in general, I think there's, there's plenty of crossover. I'd say people from a st st statistics background tend to like R. People from a software engineering background tend to like, uh, certainly they like Java and Scala uh, and, and Python. And then I think Python, there's, an, there's some overlap where it's sort of high level enough that you can, you, you can achieve many of the same benefits as R. Um, 
So Python kind of plays in both in both communities. And so, um, what what if if you were to look back over the last couple of years, you know we've seen the ex explosion just partly in terminology, you know, classifying a data scientist, yeah. but also more more broadly in applying data science to applications. Yep. Yep. What are some of those things that have pushed the walls back to allow greater, you know, application of these capability? I, I think the tools um, available, at least in the ecosystem that I work in, is this sort of op open source data science tools. Have, they're just going at an incredibly fast pace. Um, you know, the, the environments like RStudio that are used, you know, the environments like the Jupyter Notebook, um, there's, there's so many projects now and so much energy going into making uh, open source data science productive. And there's so many frameworks, there's data visualization frameworks, there's distributed computing frameworks, there's everything happening with Spark. So I think, I think as more companies have gotten excited and invested in using open source tools, it's really fostered um, an explosion of, of innovation, really. You, you mentioned actually something really interesting, and it brings up one of our earlier interviews, where you talk about the the rich choice now of yep. the, of the uh, open source tools, yep. um, and then energy in the you know frameworks yep. for visualization yep, yep, and yep. and uh, distributed computing. And what IBM was telling us earlier was, we now have to you know that that wonderful age-old trade-off trade between specialization yeah. and integration. Yeah, yeah. You know, and they, they tried to make it clear that the only way you could really service all your constituencies was if you could flow the tools, you yep. know, seamlessly yep. across them. Yep. That's, Not yeah. the same tools, yep. but, yep. you know, what's behind the tools, I guess, yeah, the models. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. How, does, how does that work? Well, it depends. I think there are different scales in which people do data analysis. I think that, that a lot of the focus here is on um, using the Spark ecosystem as a, as a sort of central organizing platform for data. Um, and that's, and that is, has all the virtues, I think, that IBM was talking about. There's all kinds of other smaller scale data problems that people solve with with all these tools as well. They, they, they're not, you know, if you look at the, 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 probably the most popular data analysis tool in the world is Excel, and it handles nothing, you know, nothing large. But there's still a lot of interesting problems that people wrestle with in that domain. So I think you know, a lot of these tools do actually span, you know, R, R certainly spans, uh, and Python spans both smaller data sets uh, that aren't in a distributed environment, and then also now the, the larger data sets. I think part of the, the interesting challenge is to create, um, is to try to leverage you know, and you see this all the time, you know, you leverage, you're really trying to leverage this incredible back end that's usually interacted with in one way with this incredible front end that usually interacts with a certain scale of data and then trying to put them together. And how far along are we or uh, where yeah. are we, you know, where are we constrained? I think, I think it's all, all the right things are happening. I don't, I don't see technical constraints to, to making these tools work really well. Um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a scaled up distributed environment. I think everybody knows what they need to do and I think you know, in the next 12 to 24 months you're gonna continue to see lots of great great stuff show up. I don't think, yeah. You know, with, with, with as much as what we're talking about in data, you know, structured and unstructured and streaming and all these great capabilities now and, and that stuff that just wasn't available, you know, not yeah. too long ago. What is R allowing us to do you know, marrying yeah. up with these new yeah. Yeah, yeah, capabilities yeah. That, yeah. that excites you, that gets you yeah. going. I, I think the stuff that I'm really excited about in R is we, we've managed to build, uh, and it's, just, it's the R community, we've invested a lot in it, a really incredible platform for, for communicating, both communicating about data uh, and also building custom applications around data. Um, so we have a, a, a system for, for creating reproducible production quality output. And this could be documents, it could be presentations, it could be dashboards within the R called R Markdown that, that people are getting tremendous value from, it, typically on these smaller scale data sets. And we have a, um, another uh, technology called Shiny, which is a web application framework for R that allows R analysts to take their work and translate it into a web application very, very easily without learning uh, all the details of the web development stack. Mm -hmm. So I look at things like 
um, our markdown and shiny that, that deliver tremendous value against smaller, you know, small and medium scale data. And, and marrying those things to Spark backends, I think is going to be tremendously exciting and powerful. So an example, uh, our markdown, what, well, you know, how, would I, how would I put that into practice? You, you'd basically, if you're, if you're, the way you traditionally use a, a, um, a report writer or, or a business intelligence tool, it says, I'm, I'm trying to make a case for something. I'm telling, trying to tell a story about something. And what I want to do is I want to combine some narrative, some visualization, some models, some direct data browsing kind of into a, a presentation or a document. Um, that's really what our markdown does. It lets you communicate in lots of different ways about, because data typically, there is a story being told. There, you're trying to make a decision, you're trying to understand a process. Mm -hmm. there's, always, there's always context and narrative around data. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really what the focus of that tool is. It's different in a way than other um, Programming languages typically you're building an application of some kind, or you're building a batch process of some kind. There isn't like a story per se around it. With data, you're always there's always some narrative, there's always some point, there's always a need to communicate about it. So that's really what our markdown is about. Shiny is really about um, is about the, creating the very shortest path between a data scientists um, getting a handle on how to manipulate data for understanding, and then letting an end user be able to do that directly by creating a web application for that. And, and are those differentiators for you then? I mean, put such yeah. aside from, you know, Java and Scala and all the those others. Those are big, that, yeah. yeah. Those yeah. are very big differentiators. I think R has the, um, for, for that, the, the, has the best system for doing that kind of, the, that kind of work. Um, you, you mentioned a couple of things in this last um, set of questions. So data needs to tell a story yep. on, on that angle. It's the analysis informs a user Right. Does the user then operationalize that directly within an application through the user yeah. interface of an existing it, 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 app? It can be. So you you might create a, a simulation for I'll just make you know a simulation for like an emergency room that wants to basically figure out capacity planning and how many people to have on staff at different times. So you might build a tool for them that that based on historical trends and based on today's data, what our staffing level should be. So you might build an application that says this is what your this is how you need to flex your staffing level. Um, so there's there are tools or are there we know tools where people in a medical practice will understand you know the the optimum doses to give, things like that. So there's lots of ways that these applications help people immediately operationalize. Sometimes it's just for understanding to support a decision, but sometimes it is for direct oper oper operationalization. And so then with Shiny, where you're creating the shortest path between yep. the data scientist and the end yep. user, is, is the goal there to help the end user, like to embed it in an app and say, you know, based on what Shiny tells you, you know, hit the yes button or the yeah, no they, button. Yeah, absolutely. People people can embed shiny applications in bigger in bigger okay. apps, or or the shiny app itself could 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 have that kind of workflow built into okay. it. Okay. Okay. Um, if you think about what people would do traditionally, right? People would create these little applications with like Excel workbooks. You know, they they do the same sort of thing. They'd say, "I've got some data. Here's some graphs. You can you can flip these parameters around. And you see different graphs, and." It turns out that, and that's great, and that works has works really well. But when you can say you have the full power of R, a full, a full programming language, incredible data visualization, all the R statistics and modeling functions, and then you can build a tool f from that, that's really interesting for people. Okay, uh, yeah. elaborate. Well, if you think it, you're, you're basically saying instead of fitting what you're trying to express into a template of you know you have rows, you have columns, you have named fields and you have graphs and it's it's a very it, it's it works very well because it's easy to get started with but if you could say instead you can create a, a, an arbitrarily complex uh, or interactive web application right you can do anything you can let the user you know brush over data to drill into data you can sort of anything you can imagine for a user interface that, that the the analyst can build in other words an intelligent a data aware canvas a data aware canvas that's cut that's purpose built for a given task you're really saying what's your task here your task of understanding or task of decision i can build you a, a purpose built tool that leverages all the data leverages great data visualization and leverages is, modeling you know and is that Yet to be done, or are you saying you could? Uh, oh yeah, people do that all the time with Shiny. Yeah, oh, they now do they do they do that with Shiny. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, um, I guess there's there's a lot to grok in here, but um, and I'm having one of my um, <laughs> my 
uh, early onset um, Alzheimer's <laughs> right, moments. Right, right. So you might have to rest Well, just uh, before we wrap yeah. up, then yeah. let's talk about uh, next phase, next yeah. wave for you then. Yeah. And where do you yeah. see... Uh, in terms of, of this relationship growing between yeah. what you're doing in the Spark community yeah. and what R is able to fuel, what kind of fire that's Yeah, we're, we're, I was just saying earlier, uh, you know, we, we want to light a bonfire under the use of R with Spark. So we're really working closely with the uh, Apache Spark community to try to make sure all the tools are in place to, for, so that our users can fully leverage Spark, and people who have invested in the Spark ecosystem can fully leverage R. So we're putting a lot of energy into that. We, we're continuing to put a lot of energy into data visualization, into this reporting and publishing framework, Shiny, and then we, we're actually building a bunch of servers and tools to sort of facilitate using those things at scale in organizations as well, so. Oh, I think I... Recovered my Alzheimer's uh, deficit, yeah. <laughs> which is, let's say you have one of these these tools like um, Pentaho, yep. which does you know data prep and, and yep. integration. Yep. yep. Um, it has the analytics. Yep. It has yep. the visualization. Yep. yep. So you know it may not be the the very best at any one. Yeah. But it yeah. takes you take a, an existing legacy app. Yep. yep. And you embed this. Yeah. As the, and you essentially upgrade the app to, yeah. you know, an ins, uh, insightful app. There, there, there are some analogs, but I think what I would tell you about the approach that that uh, that we've taken is that it's 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 essentially there's a similar kind of flow and pipeline, but the users can build whatever they want and whatever they can imagine. So so it's it's the 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 end product is is a web application, and I mean that in every way that you you know you'd write a web application with any you know with traditional web application development tools is just using R. So it's not, it's, there are not static notions of what the end user can so see. So fewer guardrails, more degrees yeah, of freedom. Fewer guardrails, more degrees of freedom. So more custom, and I think as a result, higher value. Okay. So more effort required, but not that much effort. Um, in relative to the business value, um, it's, I think it's people are- The whole ease of use, right? Yeah, the people are finding right, it to be right. a, good, a good trade. So. And George, it, it wasn't uh, on set. I mean, I was blown away by the <laughs> by the S gone to R back in the. I got hung up on that. We've been the beginning, so that's all right. But actually, yeah. that's an interesting comment because yeah. you're taking what were the core operational custom built, yep. you know, by the, you know, Harry Knuckle. Yeah, COBOL programmers, yeah, and yeah. you're infusing it with yeah. analytics. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry if yeah. I offended yeah, anyone. Yeah, yeah. No, not at all. Yeah, yeah, not yeah. At all. JJ, thanks for being oh, with thank us. Thank you. We appreciate the all time, right. and thanks for the uh, the insight on R. All right, great to be here. JJ thanks. Lair, thanks very much. Founder and CEO of R Studio. Back with more from the Cube in San Francisco in just a bit.